We'd like to open the uh, commission meeting this evening, uh, starting with uh, Chaplain Pete Mayo and a prayer. Yes, thank you. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God. We ask for your help and blessing this evening. May our thoughts and words begin with kindness. May our minds give priority to the care for our community, for fairness and justice. May we have and show respect and compassion for each other. Assist us to pay attention and listen to understand a deeper truth. May we welcome different perspectives than our own. And as we enter into the spring, protect us from the dangers of threatening weather. We ask all this in the name of all that we hold sacred. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Well, now I'll have the flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're asking uh, now for public input. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on. <clears throat> the consent agenda. Uh, I polled the commissioners and they have nothing to withdraw the, from the consent agenda, so we'll ask for a roll call vote. Make a motion to approve the agenda. I second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. All in favor, have a roll call. Brooks? Yes. Height? Yes. Munsell? Yes. Sigley? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Next we have a special presentation by the Southeast Kansas Recycling Center. Mayor, can we mention that um, Commissioner Height's on the phone, just for people? Yes, so. Commissioner Height is on the phone. I don't know if he's skiing or what this week, but he's on the phone. <laughs> no, no skiing. Okay. No skiing. <laughs> I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, good evening. My name is Nancy Scott, and I'm a Southeast Kansas Recycling Board member and volunteer. And uh, with me here tonight are some board members, back to my right, and Dr. James R. Triplett, our president, and one of our founding members. So thank you, Jim, for being here. Uh, we're celebrating 20 years, so we're very excited. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. Our mission has always been the diversion of waste materials from the landfill. We provide many services to the city of Pittsburgh in this regard. So we thought we'd kind of update you guys a little bit and we'll move it quickly. Oh, there we go. So here on this slide, you're going to see our physical presence in the Pittsburgh community. We're at 615 South Joplin and we cover about three blocks on the east side. Uh, coming down, if you see that long you know, drone picture there to the right, Coming down, the first building is the new to you reuse shop. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about this if you don't know or if you haven't used it because they're a big part of our facility. This is open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we have drop-offs. So the community drops off items to us. We go through those and when we find reusable items, we sell them uh, for our uh, nonprofit. Uh, we have eight bays and two stores uh, and staffing in there. We take everything from winter coats, household items, sports items, tools, electronics, kitchen items, books, furniture, and collectibles. And I wanna tell you this year, we donated 100 warm winter coats out of that facility to Wesley House. Next, if you keep coming down, 
you're going to come to a building called Household ha Hazardous Waste. That building and that land is owned by Crawford County. And when our staff work in that building, they are paid by Crawford County. That building is open two, day, two afternoons a week on Wednesday and Friday. They accept household cleaning supplies, home improvement and automotive, miscellaneous, including oil-based paints. We also accept fluorescent bulbs, and I'm sorry, we don't have time. You should see a picture of this bulb crusher piece of equipment in there. <laughs> it's the strangest looking thing. But you slip in a fluorescent bulb, and the bulb is crushed safely. Uh, the gases are removed. The fragments remain, and the county picks up the fragments. We have two big barrels of fragments in there. And from there, the county, uh, those fragments are recycled. Uh, Crawford County citizens can uh, bring up to $50 annually to that facility. And we do charge because of the disposable uh, needs there. Keep coming, we have the large item drop off. Most of you are familiar with that. Last weekend was one of those Saturdays. Large item drop off uh, is a drive from about Ramsey Street into our facility. Um, you, it, it's on the second Saturday, it's free. It is just that, uh, primarily furniture and uh, appliances. Uh, there are some things they don't accept, they're listed on our website. Uh, and it's free. It is there for the community and the city and the county support us with that service. The next one is the one everyone's familiar with. Uh, that is the recyclables tunnel. And uh, just tell you a little bit about that right now. We'll tell you more about that one later. But it is open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And if you're a member, you can come two other days. Um, the uh, building this year was named in honor of Dr. Triplett here, so we'll be anxious to get the signage up so we could show everybody. The last thing, and that's probably the biggest eyesore of the facility, is the appliance drop-off over on the southeast corner, and it is just that. Uh, anyone who has an appliance they don't want or found one in the ditch along the road, can uh, bring that in. Uh, we actually have, uh, I understand, a gentleman who does come in, who is a repairman, and if he sees something that could be reusable with a little repair, he gets it and he sends it out. Uh, the rest of the items uh, go to scrap metal. So that's kind of our, uh, that is our physical presence. Now we have an online presence, and we've really been working hard on that this year. Uh, so you'll see in the upper left is our uh, website page, and we really have done a lot of work with that. We use that website to instruct the community on uh, recycling and what items we take, how to prepare them to bring them to the tunnel. Uh, we're very proud of this. And also, a big thing this year is you can now donate or become a member online. Used to be you had to bring in a check. <laughs> so we don't do that anymore. Down on the bottom right is our Facebook page. And that, too, has become very important. We use that for networking. And recently, we have been advertising what uh, some specials from the reuse shop. And we've had some sales from reaching out. So we're uh, very pleased with that. OK, so you see here, I pulled this page from our website. These are the items that can come to the tunnel. I mean, there's a bunch. And if you look at the top t of the, the top line, in 2022, 915 tons. And let me say that again tons of material were processed through our center and kept out of our landfill. So we're going to look at a few of those items 
and just tell you a little bit, not all of them, there's too many, but <laughs> unless you want to be here a while. But uh, top line, second one over from the right, is styrofoam. And thanks to Dr. Triplett here a few years ago, we got a uh, polystyrene condenser. And with that, styrofoam is compacted so that when we go to ship it, it, it is more cost effective than all the bulk that weighs nothing. So it's been a wonderful addition uh, to our center. Next to styrofoam on the left is glass. And yes, we do take glass. We get very little back for glass. Uh, glass is one commodity that just doesn't pay. However, we continue to take it to keep it out of the landfill as a community service. And we have a lot of glass. Right. Okay. And then if you go on down, bottom line, first one, are books. And yes, we take in a lot of books. Phone books are becoming smaller, but we do take phone books. Uh, and we have a little bay called the Book Nook that is a wonderful bookstore. You have to come. You would just wouldn't believe what we have there for a good price. <laughs> and uh, we also have children's books. And the thing I wanted to share with you is that this year we donated 50 children's books to the Frontenac Library. Next over is another interesting item that comes to our center, clothes, shoes, belts, bags, no pillows. We call those textiles. We have an arrangement through a consortium here in Pittsburgh of eight reuse shops. When they have clothes or items they can't sell, they bring them to us. We bail them and ship them out as textiles. And the money that comes back is shared among those eight shops. And last year, those nonprofits made a total of $14,100. A lot more than they probably would have made through their store. Yeah. Okay. And one more, which is a real eye-opener. So if you go to the top, and where we had looked at glass, we're going to go one to the left, and cardboard and paper bags. And this is a very dramatic uh, material for us these days because, um, and, and you all know, with the pandemic, and with the surge of online buying, we see a lot of cardboard throughout the city, in fact, you know, that comes to us in the tunnel, other places. Well, uh, our cardboard bales have dropped on the market. And six months ago, a bale of cardboard would sell for $185 a bale. It takes 40 bales to make a truckload. So that would mean $7,400 for a truckload. Today, it's $5. Yes. So that would mean a truckload would be 200 not cost effective at all. Uh, so uh, what is happening is that <laughs> that is an example of what is happening, we are stockpiling bales till the market goes up. The other dramatic thing about cardboard happened in our own state one week ago. Sunoco, who was our um, paper mill who bought our cardboard, closed their doors. They were in Hutchinson. They closed their doors, so we are now uh, looking for a new paper mill. We'll find one. The market does this, right, Jim? Right. Yeah. Yes. So uh, anyway, let's, um, and each of these materials, I will say, fluctuates on the market. 
Okay, just a quick picture. This is a collage, but just to show you, there are people there who's, who's, who work for us and who do a great job. They're working at the tunnel and in the center. They're receiving, they're sorting, they're bailing, they're <coughs> breaking down e-waste. They are in the reuse shop going through things and being store clerks. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job. Um, so, um, and also we have an operations manager that you see there who is overseeing the staff and the transition of materials there through the center and out into shipping. And that includes household hazardous waste uh, done for the county. We gave our staff two raises last year because their, their, raise, their salaries, their wages were low. Um, so we've given them wage increases, however, their wage is still less than the average Kansas living wage. So obviously in our five-year plan that we've given to you, one of our goals is to increase their salary, increase their wages, and try to give them a decent wage. Um, let's see if they're, yeah. Wait, other way. Okay, also part of the center, obviously, is the equipment and the center itself. So our pluses there, our capital equipment, include three balers, which are used a lot, especially the cardboard baler, which is a horizontal baler, and it has been with us since 2004. And it never quits. It's always working. Uh, it's had to be fixed a few times, but it's there. We also have three forklifts, and two of those forklifts we got brand new in 2021 with some grant funding. So we were doing flip-flops over there with uh, those two new forklifts. Um, and the box truck that you see in the picture here with the new signage that we just got a couple weeks ago. Our biggest asset, though, is what you see in the middle. And that is, you see bales, but it is the space in our facility. You know, some years ago, there was space added to that facility, thank goodness, because for probably three months or more, we have had to stockpile bales till the price goes up so that we can sell it. Uh, we probably have about three semi-loads of uh, cardboard bales sitting in the recycle center. Uh, nice and clean and stacked high. <laughs> yeah, just waiting. But thank goodness for the space. Um, okay, so a quick history. It's a busy slide. The main thing we want you to know is that we started in Dillon's in 91, volunteers, thanks to this gentleman and his friends. And now, uh, and then we moved out to Holland Dillon at 4th in the bypass. And then in about 2003, things began to happen for us. We got a nonprofit status, if you look down below there. We identified a place to build a center. We had to have a brownfield cleanup. We had architectural plans made. We got some financial support. We had a groundbreaking. We changed our name to SEK Recycling. And doggone, February 04, the doors opened in this new center. So we're very proud of that. And we're very grateful to the community for those beginnings. Just a, a quick slide on, again, appreciating our roots. The history of our recycling comes back to our community. It was a community effort, as Dr. Triplett, I know, remembers. The city of Pittsburgh gave us many. You see it there. Crawford County gave us many. KDHE gave, gave us many. The total uh, on that facility ran about 230000 also, just I wanted to share these names because when I was growing up in Pittsburgh, I remember these places. So the Pittsburgh city manager at the time, John Van Gordon, helped us locate the site. Stuart Owsley did pro bono work for his architectural plans. 
and as well as Triad for their engineering services. So we're grateful for that. Okay, so now, and we're almost done. I only have 12 slides, so we're getting close. Uh, but now is the hardest part. These are our challenges, and you, you can well imagine some of them based on what I've shared already. So we had a study done from um, the director of community support services out at Greenbush last fall, and we found out that a large majority of people coming through our tunnel are not even members, and some of them don't even give donations. They just appreciate the services that are there. Uh, so one of our challenges, we want to increase membership. Uh, we have about 450 cars a week that come through on the open three days, and a majority are not members, so we need to reach out. Also, of course, as we've shared, uh, commodity prices have uh, decreased and they're fluctuating. The paper mill shut down. It's very difficult to try to run a business when your income is based on fluctuating prices. Um, the other uh, item that we've put in our plan is to uh, hopefully maybe there's a way to establish some consistent, stable funding out there. Um, we did put together a five-year plan, and we found that we may have a shortfall from last year to this year of $65,000. And uh, we're doing all we can. We're, we're doing all we can to see what, what can be done about that. Stockpiling, of course, is one thing. But the other thing to remember is that the services have continued. The doors have not closed. We have not cut back on any services. In fact, I think they're expanding. Um, so we want to you know, possibly reach out to the city and the county. Uh, you were there when we started. We may need some help now. And yay, um, we are going to have a fundraising campaign. Very soon you'll be hearing about it. We're calling it Invest in Local Earth. And uh, we hope you will support us. Our opportunities, um, and we're going to look at those too. Uh, we're looking at increased partnerships for the pickup of recyclables. We have a nice truck, and we've got people who do support us. We just need to reach out and let them know we can come and get that cardboard if it's easier for them. We're also continuing to look at grant and funding opportunities for the replacement of our equipment, oh, especially that baler, but we're, we're hanging on right now with that 2004 baler, and perhaps new technology uh, to help with uh, moving items through the, the stream. A new technology might include, through these resources, KTC, PSU, the... Um, National Institute for Materials Administration, and federal and state agencies. We also want to increase community engagement through our outreach programs, and you see them listed there. Uh, we hope to have a big presence on Earth Day. Okay, so how do you support us? You can do two things. You can go to our website, and you can online um, become a member or you can uh, donate in the tunnel, or you can also donate online. So we're trying to reach out, make that as easy as possible. I want to thank you for 20 years, and thank you for listening to us this evening. Do you have any questions? This is the man to ask. <laughs> Anyone with questions for Nancy? How much is the membership? We've fallen got about, uh, I think, 263 right now. Yeah, I, I believe it's $50 for a family. And do you remember? 50 for a family. It's 30 for, for a per single person, 20 for senior citizens and students, and 50 for a family. And Thank then you. We have ranges above that for. Special people that want to donate more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Gene's our treasurer, so you can imagine uh, his view of things. Um, well, I do want to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Um, I was included up here as a backup, which she clearly didn't need. Uh, <laughs> she, she had it totally. Uh, right. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you all. Great thank job. Thanks, thank, Nancy. thank you, Nancy and Dr. Triplett. Just to reiterate, that's 1,800,000 pounds of recycling that they went through this last year. Uh, and if you're not a member, please consider joining. They, need, uh, they, they have a deficit each year, and we certainly don't want them to go away. And we're lucky in this community to have them, uh, because in most communities, at least from where my kids live, you sort out everything uh, in different boxes and stuff, and you put it out in front of your house. You don't get to go to some place. You sort it out, they pick it up, throw the boxes back in your garage, and move on. Uh, and if you don't, you get fined. It's that simple. So anyway, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have a special presentation from, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wrong one. Public hearing, uh, Washington School LLC taxable industrial revenue bonds. Gentlemen. Mayor, Commissioners, my name is J.T. Klaus with Triple Wolf Garrison. I was here a month ago, and uh, we talked about the potential of issuing industrial revenue bonds, taxable industrial revenue bonds, for the Washington School Project. I think it was Commissioner Brooks who pointed out that that would just be the start of a three-step process, and, and that's correct. Today would be step two. So what we have done is we've published notice of your intent to issue those industrial revenue bonds in the newspaper. We sent a notice letter to all the taxing authorities that are required to be noticed. And today you'll be holding a public hearing to allow anybody to address whether or not uh, they would like this incentive to be offered for this daycare project. Um, in addition to that, we've commissioned a cost-benefit analysis uh, from Steve Robb. Uh, to show what the costs and benefits of this project are to the various taxing entities. And I'd be perfectly welcome to go over that with you in short order if you wanted to. If you prefer to have the public hearing first, it's whatever the desire of the mayor is as far as how we proceed. Why don't we go with your okay. talk first? Um, so what we have is a... Is a uh, cost-benefit analysis designed to measure the costs and benefits of this project. I will say that this is an extremely conservative cost-benefit analysis that was prepared. Um, and I think that's important because under Kansas law, a not-for-profit daycare uh, would probably be exempt from Kansas property tax anyway. But here, because of the additional element of having an operator, we believe it may not be, which is one of the reasons why Point Forward and the Washington School is uh, seeking this incentive. I tell you that because this cost-benefit analysis reflects those taxes as a cost. In other words, it puts them in as if they would be there, and it's an incentive that's being granted. Um, and so uh, I point that out because it still turns out pretty good. Um, I, if your numbering on your agenda packet is the same as mine, uh, the cost-benefit analysis for the city of Pittsburgh is uh, set forth on page 30. Is that going to be the same for mine? There's a chart there. Um, you'll see that uh, by giving the incentive over a 10-year period, Mr. Rob is forecasting that the uh, cost-benefit ratio to the city of Pittsburgh is one46 which means for every dollar in incentive over that 10-year period, you will get back a dollar and 46 cents. He calls that a 5% average return on the investment. It was actually like 4.59, but I think he's rounded it up here for purposes of uh, his projections. I'm going to go through this, and then I'll be delighted to try to answer any questions you have about the cost-benefit analysis. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, because I think it's important. If you look at the benefit analysis for the county, 
you'll see that their rate of return is not as good. It is actually a cost, but that is because Mr. Rob put in here the $700,000 grant that they're anticipating to receive from the county as a cost. And when you, if, if they get that $700,000 grant, obviously the return on investment for the county will not be as good as the one for the city, certainly not the state or the school district. Um, if you uh, then turn to page 32, you can see the rates and constants that uh, Mr. Robb used for computing the mill levy, the taxes that would be given up, uh, the effect of the sales tax exemption, uh, both on the city and the county, but predominantly upon the state. And he's uh, taken all of those rates and constants and he's combined them with the information from the applicant, which is on page 33, which is what it's going to cost, how many jobs they anticipate having, what they're going to pay, and uh, he then intends to summarize all of that on page 34 of your uh, handout. It shows that over the 10-year period, the total benefits uh, to the city of Pittsburgh of this particular project, ignoring completely any social benefits of daycare, because I know that's been an issue for the city, the total benefits to the city over a 10-year period, as he measures them, would be $801,524. The total costs and incentives being offered by the city would be $550,000. Uh, he's showing that as $251,000 in net benefits. I will tell you that that's not money you get now, so he applied a present value factor of 7.25% in an attempt to put the present value of those benefits in today's dollars and uh, came up with $175,000 uh, worth of benefits of having this project over not having this project in the community. That's how he got to the 1.46 rate of return and uh, the 5% average annual rate of return. Uh, the rest of the uh, charts intend to map that out over a 10 year period. So you can see how that's reflected for a 10 year period. If you're interested particularly as to how that money comes back and is uh, and or is uh, benefited by the city, that's on page 35, and all 10 years are outlined there, and you'll see that uh, his ultimate net benefit adds up to the annual amounts that I just described. I think that's really all that I might be qualified to talk about as it relates to the cost-benefit analysis, uh, but I'd be delighted to answer any questions. It does the same analysis for the state, the county, and uh, the K-State Extension, the Wildcat Extension District uh, as well for purposes of your review. I do want to tell you that uh, Mr. Rob asked me to deliver and I'll give to your city clerk uh, seven copies of the final signed uh, cost benefit analysis. The one in your packet is not signed, but there is no other difference between that and these that I'll provide for the city records. So in considering moving forward, we're at stage two. What you'd be considering tonight is a resolution as to whether or not to approve the tax abatement benefit, the 10 years of property tax abatement on this property. For the City of Pittsburgh, the cost benefit analysis shows that that's a positive rate of return, but it's required to have a public hearing and he'll hear all points of view on that. So unless uh, you have any questions for me before uh, I explain the resolution and how that works, I probably should just be quiet and see if the mayor wants to open a public hearing if there's anyone else here who would like to address this item. Anyone else? No. Are, are you talking about the costs? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, you need, you need to open a public hearing and let anyone here who wants to talk to talk. Okay. We'll open a public hearing at this time, and if anyone has any input, please come up and say so. Seeing none. That response is not that uncommon. So, so what I will tell you is that uh, for your consideration, and I'm here to answer any questions, there's a resolution in your packet that would authorize step two of this process, which is to proceed with the issuing of the bonds and to grant the 10-year tax abatement that uh, is associated with the bonds. Um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions about that. Uh, as a reminder, this is $6 million worth of industrial revenue bonds. 
The city is a pass-through. They're not obligated to pay the bonds. The bonds are issued, and uh, the Washington School Project is obligated to pay the bonds. Um, we also have a representative uh, from the Washington School Project here if you have any specific questions about the project that I wouldn't be able to answer. I have one. For the average person watching, and, you know, $6 million project, they see that they're raising money towards it. They've gotten money from the county. So if, if they've got X amount of dollars they've raised and they've got money from the county, why do they still need $6 million? And then where does the, the IRBs fall into play? So it's, 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 it's a very good question. It's not an additional $6 million. It's the same $6 million. We're going to take that money they're raising and whatever grants and or loans uh, they get, and we're going to issue that in the form of purchasing these industrial revenue bonds. So it's not an additional $6 million. It's the same $6 million. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to take it through this process where a uh, point forward or a bank will buy the bonds using those donations, those grants, and everything else. And the reason why is because that process entitles the project to a sales tax exemption, meaning that as the materials are acquired, they won't have to pay the sales tax which is essential to the numbers working, to the project coming out. Um, and similarly, if you approve it today, it would, it's the only way to guarantee that it's eligible for the tax exemption for 10 years. So, so you ask a very good question. It, it's not another $6 million, And actually, um, the project uh, is forecasted, as I understand it, to cost in excess of $7 million. But the only thing they're going to put in bonds are the expenditures for the building and the equipment. And so that's why... Uh, that number is six million. There won't be the architectural fees or, or the other things associated with that in that number. So, I guess I've talked a long time, but the easy answer no, is yeah, it's, just, it's, it's it's the same six million dollars. It's, it's the it's, same. It's just it's just that's how we're going to do it so that these benefits can be can be received. So is is that um, the price of the land? Is that included in the cost? Uh, the hundred sixty two five. Is that included in when you was going back about the cost analysis? Yeah, I think it's included, and let me see if I can find that page for you. I didn't. I think you started on thirty-three about that. I see it there as the investment in the land, but is it included, or is it separate? Um, uh, it's included in the total project investment that's listed there of five million six hundred and ninety-four thousand dollars. So. Uh, the investment in land is 162000 The building right now is forecasted at $3,763,000, uh, equipment at 350000 and then the miscellaneous other project costs uh, are some of those soft costs that they were, uh, were going to include in the bond issue. Okay. They may not elect to so include other, those. That's, that's why it reads up to $6 million. Right. So other project costs, what, what is that? Um, if you look at the footnote at the bottom, that's all the soft costs, the bonding, the fees, the architectural, oh, okay. the engineering, and all the contingency fees for construction and acquisition. Basically, the what could possibly go wrong fund. Gotcha. Good question. A lot of professional services are in that number. There, there's, there's a. Uh, I, I noticed that the uh, USD 250 has the greatest cost benefit from this. Are they going to have any investment in this? Um, no. What they'll get is uh, 12 students. And uh, Steve's computations were um, with the 32 jobs and the 12 additional students that it will actually benefit them. The other thing, and I'm glad you asked me this question because I should have mentioned it, the capital outlay mill levy cannot be abated by law. So no matter what you do, the six to eight mills that the school district levies for capital outlay, it will not be exempted. The project will have to pay the taxes on effectively a $6 million building as it relates to the capital outlay. So that all goes immediately to benefit uh, the school district. Um, and their... Their uh, contribution, if you will, is your work here tonight because by taking this action, the state gives you authority to abate 
the other taxes of the state of Kansas, the county, the city, and all other districts. Only the school district right now has the protection of their capital outlay. The regular uh, mill levy of the school district is also abated, but according to Rob's numbers, the benefit of the additional students and the funding from the state that will be received for those students combined with the capital outlay is a, is a pretty good sized benefit to the school district, if he's right. So it gives me an opportunity to say something else. If he's right, please don't spend this money. I mean, <laughs> this is a computation of, of, of what ifs, and he has done absolutely the best job that he can. I always think that cost-benefit analysis need to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, I would measure the value of what they're building and whether you want it in the community as equally as I would the dollars that might be achieved over having it versus not having it because these are just estimates. I hesitate to say guesses, but this is the best work that can be done in forecasting what the effect of is having something like this. Um, we all know that 10 years from now, if it goes entirely on the tax rolls, he actually has a page for that. That is tremendously beneficial to all uh, the taxing entities. But this is a forecast for the first 10 years. Okay, thank you. So, so now we'll need a resolution. Cheryl? Did you? So, so we there's, closed, a, there's a resolution we in your packet. I, yes. I, I didn't recall if we closed the public hearing for sure. That's what I, he, did you close it? I'm closing oh, the okay. public hearing. Yes. All right. So the resolution. Um, make motion to approve. Chuck? Yes, I second it. And I do too. So it's been moved and approved that we accept the resolution. Uh, all in favor, do so by saying aye. 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 And did we get, there we go. There you go. Mm -hmm. Stu says aye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank It'll, you. It's going to be a while before you see me again because the third and final step will be us actually issuing the bonds and the anticipation is that we probably won't do that until the final money is collected and the project is constructed. So unless there's something else exciting for me to be here for, it'll, it'll be a while before I'm back, but I appreciate it. Uh, the hospitality. Well, thank, thank you, you for answering. Thank, you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, JT. Okay, we'll move on then to consider the following. Resolution number 1265. Consider adoption of resolution number 1265. Next one. What? We, we just did that one. Just, yeah, that's the one we just did. We're on item B, aquatic center. Yeah, we just did that There's one. second one. We did the first one. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't look here. Oh, gotcha. That's the result. Okay. The Aquatic Center uh, valve replacement and filter cell remodel. Consider staff recommendation to accept the proposal submitted by Blue Water Commercial Aquatic Services in the amount of $58,750 for the maintenance and repair of gauges, valves, and filter cells at the Aquatic Center pump house. Evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, this project is long needed for the remodel of the pump house at the aquatic center, valve replacement, uh, filter cell remodel, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have for it. You mean, yeah. oh, okay. you, you, mean you don't want to go on with it like it is? I'm, I'm ready for a change. I bet. <laughs> no, go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. So is this the first time we've done any maintenance on that? We did this some uh, probably approximately 20 years ago, Chuck, and we just we hired a local contractor to do it. it. wasn't done wrong, but it wasn't done right, and so we're we're seeing we're seeing some accelerated problems. I mean, this should this should carry us for quite a few years. And I had another question, Toby. There, uh, the other bid included an alternate of a thousand dollars for new tank gaskets, bolts. And boats. I would think that if you get in there and take something apart, you're gonna with that new, the bid we might accept. Does that include? Yeah, it? the one the one we're recommending is it it includes everything. Yeah, and they perfect. they have a little bit more extensive experience with our manufacturers' sure. paddock uh, filter cells, and they specialize in commercial aquatic facilities. Yeah, that's all I had. Thanks. Thank you. Move to approve. I second it. Been moved and seconded to approve the uh, Aquatic Center valve replacement and filter cell remodel. All uh, say so by saying aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. It's been approved. Aye, Ch Stu. Uh, variance request, uh, Frazier. Consider the recommendation of the Planning Commission for Board of Zoning Appeals to approve a variance request submitted by Justin and Jennifer Frazier to uh, allow a setback variance at 0000 South Locust for the construction of a duplex. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. On February 27th, 2023, the Planning Commission Board of Zoning Appeals voted unanimously to approve this request for variance. Uh, the variance was requested because with it being a corner lot, it technically has two front yards. Uh, the front yard setback requirement in an RP3 is 30 feet. Um, so he requested a variance to 15 feet for front setback and seven feet on the side uh, to build a duplex. And it was approved, Justin was present. Uh, we did have two individuals show up. Um, one of them was wanting to know the zone and the other wanted to know the plan for parking. Uh, the zone is an RP3, which is a planned medium density residential, which does allow for a duplex to be built. And Mr. Frazier will be required to provide off-street parking with his site plan. Uh, both individuals that showed up did have their questions answered. Thank you, Kim. Any? Move to approve. Would, any? Chuck? I don't have any questions, no. Okay. Questions? Move, no, sir. Move to approve. Move to approve. I second it. <clears throat> Been moved and seconded that we approve uh, the variance. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Stu, aye. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, consider use permit request on, uh, on Rose. Consider the recommendation of the Planning Commission Board of Zoning Appeals to approve a conditional use permit request submitted by. Shekinah Rose and Kimberly Rose to allow a home daycare to operate at 1020 East 15th Street under the provisions of Article 30 of the Pittsburgh Zoning Ordinance. Yes, so at the same meeting, uh, February 27th, 2023, the Planning Commission Board of Zoning Appeals uh, voted uh, also unanimously to approve the conditional use permit to allow the in-home daycare. Uh, the Roses are both licensed and ready to open and both Kimberly and Shekinah were present, and no one was opposed. Any questions? I know I have no questions, but I move to approve. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve. I'll do so by saying aye. 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 Stu says aye. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Non-agenda reports and requests. Um, yeah, Mayor, City Commissioners, we have one. Help me introduce, there she is. You want to come up? Can I introduce <laughs> Director of Finance, Rhonda Shelton? She's joining us from Oklahoma City. I believe today is her second day. Second day. If you want to walk over to the mic so everybody at home can. Oh, great. She's fantastic, um, very competitive process, and uh, we were lucky to get her to agree to come with us. She's from the area, and if you have any questions for anything you'd like to share? Welcome to Pittsburgh. Thank you. Yep. I'm originally from McCune, so um, I left back in 1985 or so. Um, moved around with my husband in the military and um, ended up in Oklahoma City and happy to be back in the Pittsburgh area where all my children have settled. Um, after graduating high school, they all came back and graduated from PSU, so I'm very happy to be back. Thank you. Back to home base. Yes, exactly. Welcome. We encourage more people to settle in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Welcome home. Welcome home, Stu says. Yeah. If you didn't hear it. Anything that's else? That's all the staff has. Okay. The, the mayor's moment. Just uh, one uh, quick reminder that uh, we have on the 23rd our public meeting uh, about Spruce Up Pittsburgh. We certainly invite everyone to come, put their input in, and give us their ideas and their thoughts. And after that, we'll start moving forward with our plan. Any other business? I would like to say something. I'd like to shout out to all the area law enforcement for what occurred last week. We Good. were, I think our whole town was in a shock for one that something like this was happening in Pittsburgh, but we were all scared and on edge. And finally, whenever they got him, 
we were we all breathed a sigh of relief and everybody had a part to play and dang they got him so um we couldn't have done it without all the law enforcement and the people who came from around and helped out everybody that was part of it good job well done brent Anything you want to share, Chief? Yeah, would you like to come up? <clears throat> yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I had a few. So, you know, it's just a testament to the strong working relationship that we have with our local law enforcement partners. Um, we've, you know, beck and call the sheriff's department and our agency. We work seamlessly. Uh, the KBI, Highway Patrol, we've got offices uh, in our building for the Highway Patrol. Um, so it's just, it's second nature just to work together. Unfortunately, it came to a positive conclusion, um, considering the, uh, the dangerous situation that everybody was in. So just thank you for the words. Tell everybody thanks. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Any other comments or business? Oh, Seeing none, we call for adjournment. Move, move to adjourn. I second it. Move and second it to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Aye.